Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coach Baseball Right podcast. I'm your host and founder of Coach Baseball Right, Steve Nicolaret. Join us as we go inside, outside, and all around baseball, discussing how to coach baseball the right way. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Coach Baseball Right podcast. My name is Steve Nicolaret, founder of Coach Baseball Right. In today's podcast, I'm going to talk about three important topics. In our first segment, we'll talk about what makes a successful youth coach. Is it all about the number of games you win or the number of trophies you can accumulate? In the next segment, we'll talk about new and innovative ways to improve how we introduce kids to our game. Ways that will keep our kids wanting to come back and continue to play. And finally, we'll take a close look at why we play the game. Is it really all about being seen and exposure? So with that being said, let's get started. In this segment of our Coach Baseball Right podcast, I'd like to talk about what makes a successful youth coach. You know, last May I was on the ABCA podcast and the very first question I was asked was what makes a successful youth coach. So it's a very, very important topic and I'd like to spend some time on it today. So my answer to what makes a successful youth coach is probably not what you think I'm going to say. You may think I'm going to talk about winning a lot of games and big time travel trips and having the best players, but I'm really not going to go that way. To me, a successful youth coach is a coach that starts out with um, 11 or 12 players when they're 9 or 10, and when they're 13 years old, he still has those same players or most of those players. And he has them because the kids and the parents, they knew there was something special there, and they valued the experience. But he also had them because he stayed with those players. You see, a successful youth coach does not redefine his team every year by dropping the lesser players off and picking up better players. A successful youth coach makes all of his players better and he blends their skills into one team. A successful youth coach understands that he needs to be open to growth and committed to learning and he needs to model this kind of an attitude for his players. A successful youth coach communicates to his players. If he changes his mind, if he tells a kid one thing, and then he changes his mind. He needs to tell the kid before he posts the lineup. A successful youth coach admits his mistakes. A successful youth coach teaches skills to his players in a progressive manner so the kids can actually get better. He understands that sometimes the end skill needs to be achieved by learning smaller skills. And it's a combination of these smaller skills that are scaffold one upon the other that leads to the end skill. A successful youth coach expects things out of his kids. He expects his kids to commit. He expects his kids to call them when they're not going to be at practice. He expects his kids to wear their uniform right, to wear their hat right. He expects his kids to hustle on and off the field all the time, even when they're having a rough day. He expects his kids to root for the other kids when they're on the bench. He expects his kids to hold their their head high, even when they make an error. He expects his kids to, to pull the other kids up who are struggling. He sets that kind of a culture for his team. A successful youth coach takes responsibility for his parents. He sets high expectations for his parents and how they should act during games. And he does this by having a very productive parent meeting. 
A successful youth coach teaches his players that you can't control the outcome, but you can control your preparation and your attitude. A successful youth coach teaches the difference between spending your time in practice and investing yourself in practice. You know, there are a lot of kids that just kind of go to practice. They do what the coach says. They really don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it. And the next practice, when you do the same drill again, you have to explain the same thing to the kids about what they need to do. But a kid that invests himself in a practice, he wants to know why. He wants to know how the drill needs to be done. He really thinks about it and how it fits into the overall game experience. And the next week when you do the same drill, he knows how to do it and he knows what the expectation is. He's invested himself in that practice. A successful youth coach understands that he needs to shine when dealing with umpires or opposing coaches because it's in how he handles these situations that his players and the players on the other team are learning. A successful youth coach teaches life lessons through baseball experiences and then goes out and has a pizza party with the kids because at the end of the day, it's just a game. I think many coaches out there right now are successful youth coaches. You're doing a great job. You're having fun. And what I've described is exactly what you do. And there are moments when all of us fail to do some of these things. It's okay if we fail at doing some of these things as long as we know we failed and we make a, a conscious effort to make sure that those failures don't happen in the future. The most important thing we all can do is constantly strive to be a better coach and constantly strive to have great experiences for our kids. To me, these are the things that make a successful youth coach. This podcast is powered by E3 Consultants Group. E3 wants to awaken the inner entrepreneur in anyone who is ready to take control of their financial picture. E3's family office model is prepared to serve individuals, families, and business owners with the right mindset, regardless of your net worth. E3 Consultants Group believes it's time for a new age of enlightenment. People need people to take responsibility for their financial well-being. The problem rests with inactivity, in sitting back and doing nothing. Essentially, we've allowed an entitlement society to overtake our ability to succeed or fail on our own merits. If you are ready to equip yourself with the knowledge and strategies to break out of this cycle and take your financial picture to the next level, then E3's business model is ready to assist you in thinking differently. If you are an entrepreneur, who is helping you get to the next level? Are there financial roadblocks standing in your way? At E3 Consultants Group, their mindset is all about optimizing the tools of time, talent, and capital. Whether it happens through cash flow awareness, income tax strategies, business consulting, privatized banking strategies, wealth management, or asset protection, E3 is ready to take your mindset from worry to wealth to worthiness. John Moriarty, the founder and president of E3, is a longtime supporter of Coach Baseball Right. Visit their websites, www.e3cg.com or www.e3wealth.com, or contact John Moriarty directly at 314 314- Eight zero five nine three four nine. To learn more, tell them Coach Nicola Rod sent you. It's time to think differently. E three Consultants Group, education, empower, enlighten. In this segment of our podcast, I want to talk about some things that concern me in terms of baseball and introducing the game of baseball or softball to our kids. 
Let's be honest. We have so many well-meaning parents, uh, people working with these children, and they should be commended. But the problem doesn't lie with them. The problem or concern I have lies with the organizations that continue to ask people to do the impossible. In other words, you give a kid, or excuse me, you give a coach uh, 12 kids and you give him a schedule and you say that he's going to play other teams of 12 and uh, the event basically is going to focus on a small amount of, of drills uh, and a lot of what we call scrimmage. And to be honest with you, um, we've got 12 on 12 with one ball and a lot of kids standing around and a lot of kids taking nine strikes. And I'm surprised that kids get through this experience and want to do it again. And I think we lose a lot of kids because, because they don't want to do it again. So I propose a different way to start baseball, softball right. I propose a way that's a little bit more creative, um, a way to keep the kids more engaged, a way to keep them hustling, and a way to allow them to always be learning the game. So here's my idea. Each coach is given anywhere from, say, 10 to 12 kids, and these are his kids. And he's given once a week, he's given a, maybe a, a piece of land about the size of a softball infield, and uh, he's given time, say an hour and 15 to an hour and 30 minutes tops. Say an hour and 15 really is, is probably ideal for kids, you know, four, five, six years old, their first experience with baseball or softball. So what should happen is, is um, uh, everything is self-contained for this coach with these kids and parents. There's no umpires, you know, there's no other team that's involved. So when the kids come, to the event, what should happen is maybe you take a minute or two just to kind of organize them, to quiet them up, do a, do a, a little artificial stretch, I'll call it, because you don't really need to do that. You're just quieting up the kids. And the first thing you do after that is I take them to some simple base running. Maybe uh, when we first start off, the base running would be simple things like getting off the bag and getting back to the bag. Maybe how to run through the bag by breaking the tape. And then maybe how to stop on a dime after you break the tape. And then possibly looking over the right shoulder for, for a ball, for an overthrow. Now, you know what an overthrow is, but the kids don't know what an overthrow is yet. But nonetheless, we have to begin someplace. And we begin by taking the game apart and teaching parts of the game to the kids. So, again, I start off after a very quiet a uh, very quick, quiet time uh, in terms of maybe a, a two-minute stretch. The first thing I would do is some simple base running. Uh, after that, what I would do is I would do some throwing drills. I would be teaching the kids, you know, how to, how to start. Uh, it's a very simple ready-break throw drill. Um, and we would go through dry throws, and then we would throw to, uh, to coaches. And we would have some type of simple throwing drill. After that, I would take my kids and divide them up into three groups. Uh, one group would be focused on, um, on uh, fielding, fielding balls, fielding ground balls like infield. Another group would be focused on hitting. Another group would be focused on how to receive a ball, how to catch a ball. After that, uh, remember you have three groups of say three or four kids in each group. They rotate every seven or eight minutes. So that's going to take about 20, 20 24 minutes to, to go through those three stations, so to speak. After that, you take your kids and you divide uh, your kids. If you have five kids on a team, you do a little two-inning scrimmage. And the scrimmage would have a, a boy or girl on the pitcher's mound and four infielders. And then the other five kids would be hitting. And the focus of the little scrimmage would be to hustle and think of play ahead. We count ounce, we don't count runs. So what would happen is, um, if you can imagine a coach pitcher, a coach catcher, one coach in the field, one coach in the, in the dugout with the kids that are hitting, um, 
Each hitter would get three strikes. The third strike, the coach catcher would roll a ball out as though the hitter had hit the ball. He would roll it out to a fielder and the, the runner would run. And basically you would have your players begin to make plays at first base. Now when you first start, that's the only play they're really capable of making. But as time goes on, they can begin to think a play ahead and they will have choices. But when you first start, we have to limit those choices. Um, my suggestion is every offensive team, the first two kids that hit in that inning, they actually will bat twice. So if you have five kids uh, per team, you'll actually have seven people bat per inning. But with three strikes, it goes really, really quick. So you can play uh, about 20 minutes of a scrimmage, and the focus is on hustle and counting outs. Um, and then after you do your scrimmage, you bring all the kids together and you break up into what I call snidbits, right? Baseball snidbits. And that's the fun part for the kids. That's where you get to keep score, and that's where the kids actually get to do baseball things. Um, but they're, they're things that are broken up. Let me give you an example of a snidbit. Let's take, if we had 10 kids, let's put five kids out at second base uh, behind a cone. Let's put five kids at home plate. Let's put a coach at home plate with a ball and a coach at first base. Let's roll the ball out to the, the kids that are playing second base. Each kid has to charge the ball, pick it up, and throw to the coach at first base. The players that are at home plate will run. They'll try to beat the throw to first base. If they do, they get a point. If they're thrown out by the fielder, the fielders get a point. Now let's suppose the runners run through the bag and they break down on a dime. They can still get a point for doing that. And what you do is you keep score. And after everybody gets a chance to run and field, you go to the bottom of the first inning, so to speak. The kids who are running, they go out to the field. The kids who are in the field go to run. And you keep score. And maybe you play a two-inning game of charging the ball. Uh, another snidbit might be um, you put your kids in home plate and you put your, your kids in the field on the pitcher's mound and you'll teach them how to run and cover first base. And it's the same principle. You'll throw a ball to the coach first baseman. The pitchers will come on over and cover. They'll try to beat the runners there. And you award points based on good things that they do. Not necessarily getting it out because, to be honest with you, most of the time at five and six, the out won't happen. But if they can get there and at least uh, run over to cover first base, that, that's a good thing. Uh, I always put cones out to establish the path of the, of, the, of the pitchers going from the pitcher's mound to first base. Um, and it, once again, you keep score. Uh, another snippet would be I put runners at second base. I put the uh, fielders in the outfield, and I roll a ball like a base hit to left field. I have a catcher coach. I have a catcher, or excuse me, I have a coach third baseman. The runners on second begin to round third base and try to score, and the little outfielders charge the ball, and they throw to the uh, third base coach cut man, and he throws the ball to the plate, and you try to keep the game even, you know, where you give a point to the runners, uh, and then you try to get the guy out and give a point to the fielders, and you keep score and you keep their interest. Another little snippet is I play hockey with the kids. I put have two groups of five and set up goals, and the kids play the coach in like a hockey game. And these are all just different examples. I have several other um, things you can do with the kids, but these are these are the ways I would end my my uh, start baseball right experience. I, I always want it to be fun. Uh, and keep score because little kids love to keep score. But I want the kids to want to come back. But while they're doing these little snippets, they're learning things like charging a ball, like running through the bag, like throwing through a cut, like running from second to third to home. You're giving them little pieces of the game that they will begin to understand. And then I would suggest when you, when you finally finish your experience, the last thing you do with the kids uh, is you bring them in and maybe you talk about just a couple pieces of vocabulary. You know, what's a strike? What's a ball? How many strikes does a hitter get? How many balls does he get uh, before he gets to run to first base? You know, what's an out? 
What's an inning? What's a run? And you don't do all these things on on the first night, but you maybe do one or two of these little pieces of vocabulary with the kids. Uh, so the kids are beginning to learn. And then sometime during the season, you would take the kids, uh, you know, maybe to watch a, a high school game. Uh, and again, the whole emphasis of start baseball, right, should be fun. You know, they're not going to get a whole heck of a lot out of going to that high school game, but you'd be surprised they'll get something out of going to the game. But the bottom line is, folks, we need to change how we expose and introduce our kids to, um, to baseball and softball. We need to be more creative. We need to make sure that the kids are actually touching the ball more times. We need to allow some degree of competition. We need to be teaching the game to the kids, and we want the kids to want to come back and continue to play the game. So I would ask you, if you are a organization lead, uh, consider starting baseball right. Hey, we've got it right on our website, Coach Baseball Right. There's a whole section called Start Baseball Right. It's got drills. It's got um, progressive ways that you would teach the base running or progressive ways to teach the throwing. But more importantly than that, it's got the idea for you laid out so that all you have to do is is really implement it with your organization. So this is certainly one area of concern that I have with baseball that I do think that we all can improve upon so we can deliver a better experience to, uh, to the kids. In this segment, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that's, that's concerned me as of late. It's why we play the game. It seems to me that yesteryear we played the game for one team to compete against another and the purpose was to see if you could win the game. And in order to win the game, you had to do certain things. You know, maybe your skill was bunting, maybe your skill was speed, maybe you could throw the ball through the wall. We put together all of our skills so that collectively we could beat the team we were playing. That was the purpose of the game. And today I wonder if that's really the same, the same purpose. It seems to me that in some cases, not all, not all, but in some cases the game is played simply to showcase the skills of, of athletes. And when that happens, I think we have some dangerous concerns. Number one, the most important concern that I have when that happens is that selfishness seems to creep in. That guys begin to play for themselves. And they begin not to understand what it means to play with and for other guys. For your teammates, to be part of something bigger than you. When the game is played so that you can showcase your skills and that becomes the primary focus, I think players become a little bit selfish. I also think another concern is that players don't improve. An example of that would be, uh, I remember I had a pitcher a few years ago, good kid, great arm, and I asked him uh, to work on a few things that would maybe help him command his pitches a little bit better. And, and he came back to the program the following year and, and he had a really, really rough start. Uh, didn't command his pitches very well, fell behind in the counts, um, just struggled a lot. And I brought him into the office and I asked him what happened. And he told me that his job in the summer, according to his summer program, was simply to move the gun. Move the gun so he could be seen. And I think that was dangerous because the kid didn't improve. He had a good arm, but there were certain things that I asked him to work on so that he could actually improve his pitching skill set. And instead, what he was asked to do was, was move the gun so that he would be put in a different category. Now, let's play this on a little bit. Why was that important? Well, from a club's perspective, the more kids you can put in certain categories to be seen, the more successful the club is with getting more kids to play for the club. And we all know what that means in terms of finances. But the point is, when does the kid develop the skills that he needs to really play the game. So I think that's a, a, a concern. You know, the other concern I have is that uh, yesteryear, 
you know, if you did what you needed to do as your team played the game for the right reason, uh, if you did what you needed to do very well, you were seen and you were recruited. But you also had a chance to be part of that team. You had a chance to learn all the lessons of what teamwork is all about. And I think today the greatest, the greatest loss we have when we play the game for to be seen is that our kids don't get a chance to learn the life lessons through, through sport that they could learn. The idea that your team always comes first. The idea that sometimes you don't do what's best for you, you do what's best for your team. And, and I think in a, in a time in our society that we, we, all, we all know that it, we need to be teaching these kinds of skills to our kids, it seems that we're losing the opportunity to teach these skills through sport. That sport has become something simply for selfish gains, for individual gains, uh, instead of sport being something that, that very wise people can use to teach kids uh, the, the much needed lessons uh, that they need to learn so that they can, they can become productive, you know, dads and moms and, and uh, uh, people in our society. So, so I hope that this is something that we can at least look at we can continue to address um, and we can continue to ask ourselves, why is it that we, we play the game? Well, guys, that's going to wrap up this podcast for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we've had a chance to talk about a couple of important items. We talked about uh, what makes a successful youth coach. I hope I've given you all something to think about. We talked about introducing our kids to to baseball and softball maybe a, a slightly different way. I called it, I referred to it as Start Baseball Right. Please take advantage of, of what we've provided on our Coach Baseball Right website. And finally, we talked about why we play the game. And I'm asking all of us to consider uh, the real reason we have sport and question the idea of, of simply playing the game to be seen. Again, I hope you've enjoyed our podcast and looking forward to talking with you down the road.